Okay, Hank, we, we are starting, right? So good evening, everyone. You know, I would like to welcome Hank, uh, you know, who is joining us to share his experience in blockchain. And, uh, you know, this will be a open house in the sense after some time. So let's allow Hank some time to share his journey and then we can start asking questions. So over to you, Hank. Thanks for once again for joining us. Sounds good. Um, look, the topic, of course, of uh, blockchain, crypto, uh, Web3, metaverse, uh, these are all new buzzwords and terminologies that are getting thrown around and used uh, sometimes uh, in, uh, interchangeably and sometimes with, um, with overlap. Uh, and in many cases, the definition is not very clear. So what, what, I, what I thought, and it's always hard to frame a topic like this uh, with an audience which might have um, very different um, levels of involvement or understanding of it. So the risk is that you will either uh, go make it too basic or you'll make it you know, too uh, detailed. So apologize for that in advance. But, but what I thought I'd do is quickly frame uh, the space to start with, uh, is what is it that we're talking about? Uh, and then give a couple of um, use cases slash examples of how these uh, capabilities and technology are being used and then dive into a couple of examples uh, of uh, companies that I've been actually uh, involved in or I'm still involved in mm -hmm. uh, in various capacities. So, you know, the first and foremost, when we're talking about uh, this whole space, uh, it's good to start with what was the underlying philosophy, you know, what led to the creation of, um, what we now call, uh, you know, whether it's a distributed ledger or blockchain or crypto ecosystem. And it was fundamentally a desire to eliminate a central point of control um, where in most of the technological ecosystems that all of us have grown up with, there's always a central authority, right? There's whether it's a, 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 a database or a regulator or something, everything goes, there's a, there's a final version of truth which is some central database. And with the blockchain, the whole idea was to eliminate that central point and cre create a decentralized ecosystem where there's no one controlling factor. And that's where the blockchain technology came in. Um, with the blockchain technology basically came in a uh, bunch of different uses or use cases or um, capabilities. You know, the first one that all of us became aware of is obviously crypto assets, whether it's crypto coins, et cetera, uh, Bitcoin being the first one of those. Uh, and then it evolved towards more, a little bit more logic, uh, which was framed as what we call smart contracts. So rather than just having a digital asset that could change hands in various ways, you could have some logic that could be applied to the exchange uh, between people. And that led to smart contracts and allowed you to do a lot more with the digital assets and establish various rules that traveled with the assets. Um, and then, of course, you've seen the evolution of NFTs, which uh, in that the simplest form is just a uh, cryptologic uh, representation of a digital asset in a unique manner. Historically, we could always talk about original versus copies in the physical world, but it was very hard to do so in the digital world. Uh, and what NFTs has fundamentally done is allowed you to create unique versions of digital assets so that you could value could travel with them. And there are many interesting use cases beyond you know, dancing apes and uh, all these collectibles that have become popular. There's actually some fundamentally valuable use cases that are starting to come out of the whole um, NFT ecosystem. Um, and then, um, you know, and, uh, and uh, eventually you have this concept of DAOs, uh, um, which are kind of distributed autonomous organizations, which I won't go into because we probably won't have time, but uh, it's kind of the next level of use case using the blockchain technology. And then, you know, one of the questions that I think was being bounced around uh, as we were talking about things was, you know, what, what are the value propositions? What are the economic models? Uh, and there are many of them right now, you know, uh, obviously um, when you talk about digital assets as a store of value, whether it's Bitcoin or any other coin, uh, the first use case that evolved um, is the whole, uh, 
is a whole space of speculation where basically it was nothing more than you create a unique asset, you start trading it, you create scarcity by limiting the amount that is produced uh, and people trade it and the value either goes up or goes down. And that's fundamentally, you could call it store of value or you could call it speculation. Um, you know, over time, they'll, that, that'll get figured out. Uh, obviously the smart contracts, um, which I referred to earlier, allow you to then do more with it. If you're actually doing various forms of security settlements, you're trying to do a contractual exchange of value uh, applied on the blockchain, it takes it to the next level, uh, which there are many, many projects going on in that space. Uh, and the big difference between that and the way we do it today is that there is no, there is no DTC, there is no um, uh, central uh, regulator that is uh, saying, okay, you know, you own so much, you own so much. It is all in on the ledger, and no individual can unilaterally change it. Which also means that mistakes are a lot less frequent uh, because both sides of a transaction or multiple sides of a transaction always have the same version of truth. Uh, there's, there, there basically cannot be different versions of the truth if uh, the, the, the blockchain is working uh, properly. Um, you know, NFTs uh, are, and, and in those, obviously, you can have different economic models. You can have exchange of value. You can have commissions. You can have a SaaS structure. Um, uh, the, the economic values, uh, when you create an application, uh, in many ways, are not very different from what they are in the traditional um, business ecosystem. There are more that you can do, but but uh, they are all the basic ones still apply. Um, and then with NFTs, of course, um, you know people talk about the collectible side of it, but now you're starting to see real value starting to be experimented with. And one example one can use is in the music world. Uh, anybody that's involved in any kind of a creator um, artist ecosystem. You know, basically, the artist that's producing what they are, uh, what is being exchanged or shared or sold, tends to share relatively little in the economic chain uh, that's created in there. If you took a look at a musician, you know they produce a piece of music, and then you have to go to the, um, um, you know, basically the labels, the distributor, uh, the the streaming platforms, etc., and the musician may end up getting a very small portion of the economics of that product. Uh, and most of it goes to what's considered to be middlemen uh, in, in the, that ecosystem. You can imagine a world where uh, Web3 is now prevalent. Everybody's got their own digital wallets. Um, all of the music runs on a global blockchain ecosystem. The musician produces the music, releases it as an NFT, which is basically accessible to everybody. There's no permissions, no controls. But every time you download a song and you play it, you know, point 0.1 cent moves from your wallet, digital wallet to the musician's wallet. And so it's basically an automatic um, permissionless distribution with value accruing directly from the consumer to the producer. You know, that's just one example. You can apply it to many such ecosystems that become possible with that technology, which would be very hard to do in a client server context. Um, you know, other models that are evolving, I think one of the question is, you know, how do you make money and how, what are the different business models? Obviously, I've mentioned speculation, uh, there's uh, smart contracts, but there are other value propositions that come up in terms of applying this. Um, besides uh, the first one, of course, that became visible to all of us was exchanges, where if you've got these digital assets of whatever type, you know, where do you go buy them? Where do you go sell them? Where do you custody them? So you ended up with uh, um, platforms such as Coinbase, which provide both the custodial and trading services. Then as uh, that whole ecosystem propagated further, you had the ability to, um, to uh, store it. Then you had the ability to lend it. You had the ability to borrow it. So you could speculate uh, on both sides of the market if you wanted to. Um, and basically you had liquidity providers that basically came into being. Um, obviously brokers uh, come in all shapes and forms. So after you had the uh, crypto dedicated um, brokers, you started to have general purpose brokers starting to use them, whether it's Robinhood or eToro or others that basically came into being. Um, 
you have, because of the way the blockchain works and the validation process and technologies that are involved, you had people that created mining rigs and mining infrastructure, which became another source of revenue. So you have um, the companies like Marathon Digital, which their only purpose in life is to create infrastructure that facilitates mining and supports the Bitcoin ecosystem, and they make money from that. Uh, and now you're starting to see, um, you know, the next generation of um, platforms come in, which are fundamentally trying to create uh, an institutional framework. So unlike the Coinbase's in all of the world, which were uh, targeted towards early adopters uh, and uh, consumers um, and people who are deeply into the space, um, the, the idea is if you believe that this whole space and asset class will become mainstream, then the question becomes, okay, you know, how, who's going to support that? Because a typical institution or a fund that's dealing with uh, fiduciary money is less likely to just go to um, something that they don't believe or don't understand what the regulatory framework is and how secure is the custody aspects of it. So you are starting to see, um, various institutional platforms evolve. You know, I'm a, I came across one called uh, Minai, which was started by Zoe Cruz and a couple of people. Zoe used to be the president at um, Morgan Stanley and a group of them are starting to create a platform, uh, which I'm not involved in, but basically, uh, look, you know, the idea is to do for the institutional investor base what's being done currently for the consumer or the individual investor base. Um, and then you are also starting to see full service, multi-asset uh, platforms like FTX, which are coming in and they will do all aspects of what's involved in the blockchain slash crypto slash NFT ecosystem, and then expand it even into traditional assets. And so basically truly become a full scale uh, multi-service um, asset there. Uh, and then it comes down to, you know, what are the, uh, economic models. So we talked about the philosophy, we talked about the underlying technology, we talked about different use case, use, existing and evolving use cases. And then the last one is, you know, what are the economic models uh, as to how do you make money? Well, how, will, how do companies and how will companies make money? Uh, again, in the earliest stages, it was just a speculative asset. So you issued coins and you had all these ICOs and people would just create and issue coins that keep some of them for themselves. Uh, if the value appreciated, you'd make money. Uh, you'd make money on buying and selling them. You'd make money on custodying them. When you move on to the whole uh, smart contract, you can start to apply uh, SaaS fees there. And then there's this whole idea of uh, tokenomics, um, you know, basically using tokens as a source of generating economic value. Um, and that, uh, you know, comes from basically the appreciation and the value of tokens, but that's starting to become a lot more sophisticated. Uh, and there are some platforms where you're starting to see um, two different types of tokens being issued. Um, you know, so one, one is a token that is the medium of exchange. Um, so if you and I are trading uh, a product or a service, you know, what is the medium of exchange? If I'm giving you something of real value for, you know, if you're trading agricultural commodities, um, the biggest mistake that people in the early stages made in this whole space is trying to make the medium of exchange a volatile speculative currency like a crypto asset. You know, so Ripple try, is still trying to, uh, for example, you know, basically uh, do a, uh, move money around the world using XRP, but if the underlying asset itself is volatile, that makes it very difficult because you don't know how much value you're exchanging. So the idea of stable coins started to come into being. Um, the problem with most of the stable coins that uh, came into being is, you know, your, your trust in that stable coin is entirely dependent on your trust uh, on the fact that it will maintain its value. Uh, and, you know, if you can say what you want, that it's asset backed, but how much will people trust it? I mean, in theory, people don't even entirely at a large scale trust, um, you know, banks. So they're not going to trust a, a crypto custodian. So there's a new generation of um, 
providers coming in with stable coins, which are working jointly with central banks um, and where the underlying uh, fiat that's backing the stable coin is actually sitting with a, a credible, not just a bank, but potentially a central bank. And then suddenly you've got an asset that can uh, you know, credibly claim to have stable value and it's a digital version of currency. So you can actually use the underlying technologies that we're talking about to move value around the world, um, either in the form of trade or service or contracts uh, and not worry about whether that will be volatile or exchange its value. But the same organizations that are looking at the models using stable coins are also considering um, issuing a different form of a token and which is called a utility token. Um, and that utility token is actually used to, it, it is speculative, it is volatile, uh, and it, uh, it basically accrues value from uh, the cash flow of the business. So you have these two tokens. One is the medium of exchange, which is stable, and you can do the business related it, with it. And then the other, you know, you can actually think of it almost like the quote, the equity token, uh, even though regulatory wise, you're not allowed to use that terminology um, because then you have to be registered um, as a, you know, as, an, uh, as, as, a, as a listed ecosystem. But, but fundamentally, if you really look at it, it is essentially a form of equity where uh, the value of the business accrues to the holders of the utility tokens. So, you know, that's kind of the framework in which this whole blockchain ecosystem is evolving. And so far, you know, we are just seeing the very, very beginnings of what um, is possible using the technology, you know, and I think I wouldn't venture to say, you know, where all of this stuff will end up because as we all know, when we all got exposed to the internet in the mid nineties, you know, whatever we thought it would become, you know, it turned out to be the reality turned out to be some things were similar and evolved and many things we couldn't even have possibly imagined as to the impact it would have on the whole uh, global ecosystem. So let me just pause for a second there I mean, um, and see if that kind of helps establish a little bit of a framework. And then I'm happy to do a dive into a couple of examples of actual companies and what they're doing in this space. Thank you, Hank. It was great. Uh, you know, if any any of our members would like to ask anything on what has been talked so far before we ask Hank to go proceed with the examples, you know, you, please raise your hands and I'll allow you to talk. So or I think, I... Hari, there are a couple of questions on the chat already. Okay, okay. let me yeah. look at it, yeah. Ajay asks, are smart contracts more applicable in public space when two strangers get into transactions? However, what, what about in enterprise space and technology may be usable, but what would be the value of such a company? So, so let me give you, uh, the, this is a good uh, segue to actually jump into, um, um, jump into a specific example. Um, one of the challenges with the uh, enterprise space um, in using smart contracts or even the blockchain ecosystem is obviously regulation because the minute you start talking about money uh, there are regulators and governments that have a very strong vested interest and they don't want money floating around without having visibility into um, that ecosystem so uh, so basically um, in, in the basic sense, uh, Ajay, um, yes, uh, in enterprise space, there are lots of uh, interesting ideas being done. The early ones that were, were that were came into being was in settling um, basically contracts. So if you are trading OTC derivatives in New York, um, you have basically historically um, equities were traded on an exchange and the so uh, places like DTC, et cetera, would be the central custodians and they would make the final um, final uh, records would be basically kept with them. Uh, OTC contracts were bilateral. So, you know, if Goldman Sachs did a trade with Morgan Stanley, they would both keep their own version of that record. 
and then they would reconcile and, and that would be the way the trading would happen. If you applied, if you basically moved the OTC derivatives onto a blockchain structure, um, then that would be an enterprise use of uh, a smart contract, which would not only say, okay, fine, we did this trade and you own, uh, you know, you are short so many contracts and I'm long so many contracts, but you could then embed in that a lot of different logics as to, for example, if you're talking about credit default swaps, well, credit default swaps have terms that apply to it as to when they get triggered. Uh, and those are written into physical contracts, where it is in a blockchain, it could actually be codified right into the contract itself. And in theory, they could be automatically triggered. So you don't need a central authority to declare um, you know, basically that a company has basically defaulted, um, you know, as, as the contract's capability becomes more, and that's just one example of where an institutional thing, uh, uh, capability applies. There's another very interesting one, which I will do a little slightly deeper dive in if we have time, which is a company that is actually uh, creating, um, using the combination of all of the things that I mentioned, the underlying technology, blockchain, crypto assets, uh, stable coins and utility coins to facilitate uh, basically contracts and exchanges on a global scale, initially applying it to something like agricultural trading at a, at a global level. And the, you know, Ajay, the, the other question you asked is whether when the government of India RBI launches a CBDC, it can act as a stable coin. The answer is yes. But I think that will be phase two. The phase one of a stable coin, you know, I've spoken to uh, people, I ran a, uh, sorry, I forgot to do an introduction, but I, among many things, I, at one point I ran a cross-border payments company across 140 countries and had plenty of opportunity to deal with regulators, including the Reserve Bank of India and the Bank of England. And remember having a conversation with Mark Carney and uh, who was then the governor of Bank of England and asking him, you know, whether the Bank of England would ever consider is issuing a stable coin. And he said, yes, but it will be quite a while because the implications are not fully understood. And before a, a major uh, central bank is likely to issue something like this, it'll be quite a few years. But in the meantime, he said, we are very willing to be supportive of that space, as long as it's done in a visible, transparent, and a regulated manner to see how it evolves. And that's what one of this, this agricultural company that I'm talking about is actually working with a stable coin that will, in theory, will be custodied at the Bank of England. So it'll be almost um, um, a CBDC, but not quite. I don't see any Does other Does anyone questions. want to ask any other question? Before Hank can move on to the next examples. Yeah, I think let, uh, I, I have some question, but I'll wait till the end. Uh, I mean, after he's finished his presentation. Okay, so, so, so uh, I think, you know, uh, let, let me just use this. Um, there's a couple of companies that, that, that I'm involved in you know, uh, some of them are more easy to understand and relatively straightforward. So let me just mention those. There's a company called Bridgeweave, um, started in London uh, by uh, somebody, Akshay Bhargava, who used to be the head of uh, wealth management at Barclays. Uh, you know, many of you guys may know him. He's been involved in many uh, companies and boards uh, in India. Um, and the idea that he and his team were working on was to create an AI-based wealth management platform, which had nothing to do with, uh, in, in the initial instance, with uh, blockchain or crypto. They created uh, smart AI uh, algorithms that would basically help facilitate consistency in the trading ecosystem and investment ecosystem, and then work with large-scale brokerages to apply that uh, with their agents for the underlying customer. Uh, and they worked on these algorithms, they were working quite well. And then along the way, they saw an opportunity, they were getting asked the questions, can these algorithms um, uh, uh, be applied to, um, you know, to the blockchain ecosystem? And they basically tested it out and realized that while the traditional uh, investment algorithms that they were using were using three, six and nine month 
timeframes to apply it. And that didn't apply to crypto because uh, crypto is a lot more uh, volatile. They were able to experiment and apply it to much shorter timeframes, like three, six, and nine hours. And so they are in the process of launching uh, a product which will allow anybody, whether institution, brokerage, or a consumer to load up a certain amount of value into their wallet and then set certain parameters. And then using these AI algorithms, it will basically facilitate trading on an automated basis within parameters that you set. Um, and it's a, it, I think it's a very simple, but very good early stage example that will allow people who are interested in getting exposure uh, to this space to dabble in it without having to do a deep dive and understand, okay, how do I buy crypto assets? How do I do an on-ramp and an off-ramp? How do I trade it? Am I trading it efficiently or inefficiently? What is the spread? Am I trading it? Will my money get lost? All of those things which you have to kind of answer if you want to get involved at a native level, it gives you basically one level removed. So it's early stages. They're launching a prototype and a beta um, shortly. And I think it could be quite interesting. Um, you know, there's um, um, the, the, the one that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's a couple of companies that I've been involved in in the past. Uh, which, which didn't work out, uh, with, but which were fascinating learnings. Um, uh, you know, they were a little early in their space um, and they would fall into the category more of what we would now use the terminology of web three, four, i.e. Um, ba basically it's a ecosystem where there's no central control uh, and the data, it doesn't reside with any individual uh, company but is uh, custodied with the individual whose data it is. Um, whoa, so I'm suddenly seeing uh, a lot of new people pop up. Um, um, so, so, so I think, um, you know, that was the company called Digi.me, which created um, a whole very interesting concept of giving each user a secure data wallet and the whole idea was no matter what functionality you're doing uh, on the internet, your data would only reside in your wallet. And if a company wanted to come and offer you services that needed to use your data, rather than ask for your permission to store your data, they would ask for permission to operate on your data, which would always stay on your crypto wallet. And the idea that way is you can give permission, you can take away permission, but your data never leaves wherever you store it, whether it's on your computer or on a cloud or whatever, and it's controlled by you for uh, forever. And it also over time gives you the ability to monetize that data. Uh, so I think that's something that is, um, <clears throat> but that company has, has uh, I think it was a little early, maybe they'll come back again, but the con conceptually, was a very fascinating and you could spend hours just talking about the use case and value proposition that they were and are trying to, um, uh, to navigate. I, I sat on the board of that company for a while. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but I would say in the scheme of the evolution of Web3 and um, this whole ecosystem, they were probably a little early. Um, the, the other company that I am currently uh, an investor in, um, and marginally involved in, but mostly as an investor, uh, is a company, it's a combination of two companies. One is called L3 Costs, um, which is a re regulated, which basically is doing, taking the blockchain platform to the next generation uh, and creating a regulated version of the blockchain. Now, what does that mean? It means that basically you have, uh, you're using all the blockchain technology as we currently know it, uh, with no central reservoir of information, bilateral confirmation, et cetera. But what they're doing is they're working with regulators in each of the countries where they're doing prototypes um, and basically allowing, giving um, visibility to the regulator for any activities that are taking place on that blockchain for their regulatory framework. So for any activities taking place within the UK, uh, they would give basically regulatory access to all activity in complete transparency to the Bank of England and the FCA. Um, if 
the they were uh, launching something in, in in India, they would give that access to the RBI, and they can set the rules. So basically, you can have global uh, transactions taking place without regulators having to decide, oh, do I trust this and do I give them permission or do I block this because I don't understand it and I don't know what mischief could be done on this platform. So it, it, it's a hybrid concept, which I think is quite powerful. It's early stages, obviously it'll take a long time for it to get credibility and traction. But one, one of the businesses that is being launched on it um, is one that I briefly referred to earlier. It's called Agridex, which is basically, a, a, that's not part of the underlying blockchain, but it's an application that sits on top of that blockchain. And it's basically for trading, large scale trading of agricultural commodities on a cross-border basis at a global level. So the idea is that you have suppliers and consumers and transporters and brokers that operate in the global agricultural ecosystem. Right now, it's all done on a bilateral basis through letters of credits and physical contracts and transportation agreements and all of that stuff. All of that can be essentially coded into smart contracts and suppliers can sign up to uh, basically sell their product to various participants in that ecosystem uh, on the fulfillment of certain activities, um, you know, whether harvest has happened, the, 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 the product has arrived at the warehouse, the warehouse basically certifies that on that blockchain, and it automatically releases it to the transportation company. When the transportation company says it's all in, 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 in progress, it triggers an insurance contract which ensures it for the duration of the, the journey when it arrives at the other end uh, and it's certified by the warehouse that it's arrived, it releases um, a, a monetary value in the form of a stable coin, which basically automatically gets credited to the, the farmer or the supplier, et cetera. Um, that uh, platform, Agridex, is basically working with the Bank of England to issue a token called AgriToken, which will be backed one for one um, with, with basically uh, a, a pound. So this is a pound-based, uh, UK-based platform. So each agri token will be worth one pound and the pound will be custodied to the Bank of England. So people, and certified by the Bank of England so that you can be confident that you will get your money, but the money can move digitally around the world without having to do wire transfers and getting blocked with KYC and all of that stuff. And the Bank of England will have full transparency and visibility uh, into the activity that's basically going on there. So they're not, they will be less worried about, you know, sort of KYC money laundering issues. It won't be any different than it going through a bank. Similarly, if the country of origin, you know, unfortunately, the first launch country that they had were, uh, uh, that a plan to launch was Ukraine, given the size of the agricultural uh, business over there. And obviously that, that got put on hold for, for obvious reasons. But, but the idea would be that the, the central regulator there would have equivalent visibility into the origins of the idea. And then this whole ecosystem could work on a seamless basis. But the same company, Agridex, also issued to fund the development of, um, of, the, uh, of, of this business was something called utility tokens, which uh, people who invested in building the platform, which included me, myself, um, would basically have some access to utility tokens. And the utility tokens have um, basically uh, the rights to any, a certain percentage, in this particular case, 50% of any cash flow generated by Agridex over the life of the business. So, you know, it basically is a way uh, of actually accruing value uh, based on the economics of the underlying and cash flows of the underlying business. Um, that that basically operates. So that's a very simple version. There's a lot more complexity to the businesses, um, and on the same, you know. But but basically, it's a simple version that uses pretty much all the aspects of what I mentioned, from the underlying base layer technology to the digital assets to um, smart contracts to stable coins and utility coins, um, and you know. It, Eventually, it could become a DAO, but right now, that's not in the plans. Thank you. So, 
very much thank the we will now open the floor for questions you know please uh, you know i know there are some questions in the chat but uh, you know you can sort of uh, all of your speaking has been enabled so you can speak and ask the question directly to hank so hank uh, kind of couple of very fundamental basic questions my early education in blockchain or crypto happened under the libertarian sort of regime in us uh, like ron paul you know they they believed in 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 kind of uh, taking the control away from from the government in in their private sort of life and affairs um, so so there i think the the value proposition was that uh, this whole blockchain uh, crypto would take away the government sort of pervasive control over everything in life but i think over a period of time all the governments around the world are kind of coming around and 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 kind of opposing that philosophy and i think sooner or later uh, i think uh, you know that that is not going to kind of remain as a as a sort of stable currency but beyond that i think blockchain as a technology i think has a huge use case so my question would be that for india you know where i think government is also um, totally opposed to a kind of free uh, economic sort of uh, you know crypto concept so for india in blockchain what can work which will harmonize with the regulations of our government what can work what can sure. we look at so i think the, that's a fantastic uh, question for well, but there are many many different aspects to it so let me just try to unpeel that onion firstly uh, you're absolutely right uh, that you know when the whole blockchain uh, ecosystem started it started to move away from central control and particularly government control you know for people that are interested in the origins of um, blockchain and crypto and how it evolved and the people who started it and the fundamental underlying philosophy there's a book i would highly highly recommend that you pick up it's a very easy read it's fantastically entertaining and it's beautiful it's a book called the infinite machine uh it's written by a venezuelan lady uh who used to be a bloomberg journalist called camila russo who lives in new york and has now become a, a friend uh and um you know I, she's starting a new platform called defiant which wants to be the blue bloomberg of the um of the digital ecosystem system and the blockchain ecosystem but it really talks about what they was talking about is the philosophy of what led to the creation of it now as you kind of take it forward um i think you will see both aspects of it evolve uh, i definitely think you will continue to see that ecosystem that you described as libertarian or lack of central control existing in many use cases some use cases the governments will support and will be fine with because because they don't interfere with regulated ecosystems you know same as the internet when the internet came out it was free for all then it kind of became a platform to do various activities some of those activities require regulations um if you want to trade on the internet if you want to move money on the internet but others uh, don't if you want to do social media if you want to exchange information they don't require regulation um so you know you will you will have see the same thing happening on what will eventually probably end up becoming called web3 which is basically the internet which runs essentially on decentralized data uh and you'll see both pieces of those uh to go back to the 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 india context i can see you know the the um if you look at the latter part which will require regulation there are so many in fact i think in one of the chats somebody mentioned an example which i think is a very good example uh, of where it could be used is 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 land registry right where basically right now the only proof you have that you own a piece of property is there some register sitting with some registrar where that is written in and if somebody could go in there and erase it and erase your name and write my name then suddenly i become the owner of that uh you know if you could move all of that um onto a blockchain uh, where basically there's no central record and no no single uh, person can change it and when you trade it it is done through the property is traded through a smart contract and a stable coin 
which is essentially regulated, uh, then suddenly properties can change hand with none of this uh, shenanigans that sometimes happen in India when you try to you move property around uh, would be possible. So that's just one example of it. The example that I used about music uh, is would be another example of it, which would probably be fall into the unregulated side, where music would be not released by these platforms, but would be released by the musicians themselves. Um, you know, another non-regulated aspect would be in the art world. Uh, where today, when a painter paints a painting and they sell it, uh, whatever they sell it for, basically that's the price they get. And then from that point on, they have no say in or value accretion. And if that painting is sold for a thousand dollars and 10 years later sells for a million dollars, they get no part of the value. If that painting is sold as a combination physical and digital asset, which are combined and all the intellectual property rights to that piece of art sit in the digital asset, then the, you could have it coded in the digital asset that every time this changes ownership, a certain percentage of that value of the increase in value accretes to the original artist. So, you know, these are examples, you can go wild with ideas, but they are an infinite number of ideas because the underlying technology obviously is just creating capabilities and one thing we know is the human ingenuity is so great that once people start to understand what is possible, many creative and interesting and new ideas will keep coming around. But the reason I started investing in this space earlier, fully recognizing that most of the companies that I would look at in the early stages are likely to fail, but it was really to have a seat at the table uh, to understand how that ecosystem is evolving, what ideas are coming up, and you know the entrepreneurs I'm working with, you know the I think the oldest one, well if you leave out Akshay who's doing a traditional investment platform, most of them are in their twenties. So Hank, uh, this is Vikas here. So just expanding on the example that you just gave, a few examples, music and art. So actually, one can say that any form of creator economy could have application for you know blockchain whether it's ed tech or healthcare or, you know, the, any content I create, uh, I can sort of make sure it is distributed. I have an IP and uh, I can continue to monetize and take value. So therefore, as the downstream app, and this these could be relatively low on regulatory control. So what is preventing from the explosion not taking place, at least in this basic, creator economy for any information flow content or product right back on the blockchain ecosystem. Absolutely. So, so basically, it's two things. The, the obvious one is, um, is knowledge, awareness. You know, obviously, most artists are not tech savvy. Most creators are not tech savvy. Uh, and very few people um, have the confidence in terms of investing in building this capability. But the other and more practical constraint currently is it requires the existence of an infrastructure. So if you take the example I used of music, that, you know, just I can create a piece of music in the form of an NFT and release it to the cloud. But for that transaction to take place the way I described it, and there's probably many other ways it could, but to take place the way I described it, where every time somebody downloads and plays that song, 0.1 cent moves from their wallet to the musician's wallet, that underlying infrastructure of everybody having a digital wallet needs to exist. And that currently doesn't exist. So, uh, you know, as it becomes, you know, today, everybody's got an email address, everybody's got a mobile phone number, everybody's got, um, you know, so if you, if you look at money transfer on a domestic level in the US, you know, what did it take for things like Zelle and Venmo and all to come into being? The technology and the capability was there 25 years ago. But what it took is basically everybody having unique uh, address, either in the form of an email address or a mobile phone number, which could be then linked to their bank account and hence could be used as the token for transferring that value uh, on a reliable basis. And I think when, uh, when everybody's or a, or a reasonable proportion of the global population or a particular set of people that are involved in an ecosystem end up with these digital wallets, which sit on 
an ecosystem that are interconnected uh, in a in a with a using a uniform protocol, then you can uh, start to launch these products. And I actually don't think we are that far from it. You know, maybe it's it's probably single digit years rather than you know a lot lot longer because the pace of evolution of the space is starting to um, to really speed up. The the thing in in many ways the thing that's actually holding um, the de faster development of the space is the very thing that put it on the map, which is this association of the blockchain so strongly with cryptocurrencies. And so people, you know, many people just think of it as a speculative volatile asset with the wild west, as opposed to a underlying technology that has, that was just one implementation of the technology, but the, the capabilities are much more fundamental than that. Right. So would you say that, you know, as a early stage investor standpoint, the one should be looking out for entities that are helping in creating this enabling infrastructure ecosystem? Is it that people can build parts and, and capture value or somebody has to come and make this railway network across the country with platforms and stations and coaches before you can cut the first ticket? Or is it that you can have maybe smaller level of build outs and still have value and therefore one should be, could be looking for such early stage enterprises to invest in? So, so uh, I, I think, um, you know, not surprisingly, because it's, uh, the answer is all of the above, um, you know, they all have different risk profiles and different timeframes associated with it. I, for one, when I'm filtering opportunities, the first question um, I apply as a filter is there a fundamental value creation use case uh, in this um, in this game plan? You know, if 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 it is fundamentally, oh, I'm going to launch uh, a token and I'm going to do an airdrop of a token and I'll issue a billion tokens uh, to everybody at a discount and then I'll keep you know 200 or million of the tokens for myself and then I'll figure out. Uh, a social media campaign to get people to buy these tokens so that the price will go up and then I and all of my early investors can sell it, you know, that is an automatic, um, you know, sort of a screening criteria, which you basically doesn't mean people have made lots of money through those concepts, but fundamentally there is that's pure speculation and that is almost certainly getting and is going to continue to get regulated out of existence because that's just um, you know that so but but if somebody comes up with an idea where you look at it and say oh wow this is an interesting use case and I can see how it adds value then you can basically evaluate it like you would evaluate a business and say okay what is the use case what is the addressable market what is the going to be the constraints and barriers to adoption etc so that's that's in the um, in in coming up with a new use case the underlying technologies absolutely you know you know the, the old age old saying of, you know, when, when there's a gold rush in invest in picks and shovels applies to this uh, ecosystem as much as everything else. The challenge, of course, in all of that is to pick the, make the right bets. And that's not straightforward. You know, what, what technologies will end up, you know, starting with what blockchain, you know, do you use the Bitcoin blockchain? Do you use the Ethereum blockchain? Do you use Cardano? Do you use Axia Global? Do you, you know, there's, there's probably, 20 or 30 credible ones and another 1,000 less credible ones out there, um, you know, which ones will be the winners and how will that all work? That is still um, unknown, you know, I think. Who, who um, would help build those standards? Will this, I, it, would you that, need that, a regulator? I mean, do you yeah. ever need a regulator from the back door to create standards or somehow it'll settle by itself that the most dominant technology will win, others will coexist? How do you see this shaping up? Look, I'll give you my opinion on this, and I'm not smart enough to know the answer to that question. Um, but if I think of it in terms of where this whole campaign started and what Uday was talking about with the libertarian backgrounds, I think it's highly unlikely that these standards will be centrally dictated. I think this is, um, you know, um, this is basically a a consumer slash user slash eco-driven um, um, concept. And the power is the power of the broad adoption 
by the users themselves. Um, and so it is very much an open source culture. So the standards will be developed just as they have developed in the broader open source ecosystem. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that's, I mean, the organizations, and again, you know, this, if, if, you, if you have the time to read Infinite Machine, you'll realize how these ecosystems develop. And in, in that one, basically what Camilla has done is she's just done a deep dive on Ethereum. She followed the founders of Ethereum. Where did they come from? Who are there? How did they come together? How did it actually develop? How did it become a standard? How did it get propagated? How did the technology evolve? You know, and that's just one example. Um, and there are many equivalent examples, but it actually gives you an insight as to how this ecosystem develops. So if I had to guess, I would say it will, um, it will, uh, develop uh, on on a uh, sort of a grounds up basis uh, on a distributed basis, and this concept of which I didn't touch on um, is this the DAOs, decentralized autonomous organizations, which essentially become self regulating, self controlling uh, organizations um, without anybody being in charge, uh, and those are the ones that will end up uh, establishing standards and hopefully. Eventually, all of the—I don't think there will be a single blockchain or a single platform or a single ecosystem. There's likely to be many, many, many that survive. But the key will be that there will be, um, um, you know, sort of inter-blockchain protocols that will allow you to not only transact across blockchain for different purposes, but will also allow you to move capabilities and assets uh, across blockchains, whether di digital assets. NFTs, uh, you know, all the way to your social avatars um, in the whole um, metaverse platform, which obviously is a whole separate topic. But yeah. So Hank, this is uh, Ajay here. Uh, building on to the example of music, I'm just uh, keen to understand when you talk about infrastructure, can companies uh, or, or you know something like Apple Music or Google Music or Spotify are these the candidates to adopt this technology and, and disrupt the business model? Or, or it would, in your view, it necessarily is a, somebody, you know, let's say new Spotify comes up and, and disrupts the whole thing. Yeah, so I think, I, I actually think uh, the names that you mentioned are the disrupted, not the disruptors. Because mm -hmm. if the model that I actually described comes into being, there will be no Spotify, there will be no Apple Music, there will be no middlemen, and there will be no opportunity to scream off money as an intermediary between the musician and the consumer. So the people will be the ones, um, will, will, will actually be the ones that, for example, the, the capabilities, you know, just to you know, make it up, don't take this seriously, but you, just to use as an example, you know, the kind of businesses that will get created will be firstly uh, the wallet infrastructure, which will be created as a general purpose, not just for music. It's being created and more and more will be created. Then somebody will say, okay, the world is ready to receive music uh, in this forum, but you know, how do artists at, um, attack this space? So somebody will then create a platform and a tool set to allow artists to uh, release their music in the form of a digital NFT. Uh, and they'll create a platform and tools that will be focused on servicing the artists in helping them getting their music onto this ecosystem. Uh, and they will have an economic model. It could be a SaaS economic model. It could be a transactional economic model. It could be whatever. Um, and then they, so that will create the content and move it onto the platform. And then there will be payment rails that will exist. Again, the payment rails are likely to be um, general purpose payment rails that basically allow money to move between wallets. And then there will be a smart contract embedded into the NFT, which automatically, uh, anytime somebody plays it, so basically in order to play music in this ecosystem, you'll have to link your wallet to uh, this payment ecosystem. And so every time you won't have to do anything, you click or to play a song, it takes a very small minuscule fraction of a cent and moves it from your wallet to the artist who you may not even know who it is. And they could be in completely different parts of the world. It could revolutionize the whole space. And the biggest beneficiary of this would be the consumer and the producer and the creator. Uh, Hank, this is Rajneesh here. Uh, 
have you come across sakhi jason question uh, have you come across opportunities uh, you know in cyber security being applied to this universal blockchain and crypto and and let me uh, and i'm still studying this uh, let me give an example this is concept of blockchain bridging and i believe where, where the tokens are arbitrarily exchanged i believe those are prone to hacking so i'm just trying to understand you know have you come across such uh, such opportunities uh, you know because that's again uh, in exploding space yeah so th th the answer there is that uh, look uh, that is probably uh, a very very significant area that needs to develop uh, in order for this ecosystem to become truly truly mainstream particularly at the institutional level uh, i personally um, have heard chatter about people talking about the space i have not personally been involved or seen uh, in detail anybody doing it but i'm almost certain uh, that there are many people that are kind of looking and working in this space because you know all of the bigger issues that one has seen um where there's been you know meaningful loss unintended loss of value uh, you know not from speculation but from from um nefarious characters it's been uh, on the space either through hacking um or or, or through errors uh, you know where because that that's the the very thing that makes this whole platform and ecosystem incredibly efficient where information contracts logic can flow between different ecosystems without anybody without the two counterparties knowing each other and knowing where they are etc it also makes it very prone to not only hacking but also to errors if you send it if you if you're doing any kind of manual transfers anybody that's moved money um, using one of these crypto exchanges you know you got to take the 64 character alphanumeric chain and cut and paste it and if, if god forbid you try to copy it uh, manually you know the chances of making an error are doing and once you hit enter there is no going back you know if you moved so when i do transfers and if i have to move a hundred dollars i'll all first i'll always try to move one dollar and then confirm that it actually arrived at the other end and then i'll do the hundred dollars right. uh, but otherwise there there's no way to do it now that technology is starting to become a lot better where rather there are, are qr codes uh, that represent the 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 the, the address so rather than having to deal with these characters you're actually just scanning your camera on it so there are technologies that are coming up but i'd say we are probably on the early stages and the whole security and cryptography part of it is definitely an area that's going to take be a source of a lot of challenges and problems but also a lot of opportunity right thanks a lot yeah uh jadeep mehta yeah hank uh, thank you for the session today it's been a fantastic one hour for me i have a very dumb ass question so please don't laugh if it doesn't make any sense when you've repeatedly talked about the fact that the intermingling in the public image of blockchains with cryptocurrencies has created a lot of negativity now when we look at india for example practically everybody on this call will be using upi based digital payments on a daily basis right what's stopping us from creating a blockchain where instead of cryptocurrencies or stable coins we simply attach it to the upi system and just use rupees instead of some notional fictional tokenized kind of currency here so so uh, it is not it's a very relevant question um, and i'm very familiar with upi i was actually Uh, working very closely with Mr. Hota when the mm -hmm. whole concept of UPI was getting uh, established, because I was in the deep in the whole regulated payments ecosystem back then. <clears throat> But <clears throat> that <clears throat> what, what UPI <clears throat> is what you could essentially consider. It's, it's probably I'll get crucified uh, in the uh, in in the in the blockchain uh, metaverse chat rooms for saying this. But basically, <laughs> you could essentially think about. it as a closed loop blockchain uh the power of blockchain is that it is open loop meaning that um there is no no central authority that is governing um you know who's participating how they are participating uh, what uh, how how they link it's all open source and open concept so the business models 
<clears throat> which either um, work with or require you to be part of a closed loop ecosystem, <clears throat> then, then you are absolutely right that something like a, a UTI or UPI can basically work with it. Uh, the, 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 because the concept of, you know, fundamentally for those who are technologists, I started my career running technology at Goldman, um, you know, the, for those, you know, many of, of the people on this call uh, probably have, are, are all technologists, you know, it, it, the, the core underlying technology of a blockchain at the very simple level is just a multi-phase commit database, right? Where it's, you're doing synchronized updates on multiple locations at a global basis. So that's, and that's to some extent what happens in the platforms like UPI. So it, it really is to take that concept and make it much more open, right? So it's like the internet, when the internet, if you had a closed loop cor intercorporate internet when it first came out, where you had a central database and everybody connected with each other and you happen to use the TCP IP and HTTP protocol, but in a closed ecosystem, that would be also the internet, but it would be an internal internet as opposed to connected to the broad open internet. I understand. So yeah. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. We're probably a longer discussion for another time because sure. I do see, for example, supply chain centric enterprise applications where closed loop internet to just paraphrase what you're saying, uh, you know, or, or rather let me say permission blockchains, which are in fact controlled in a sense by the corporation, but have all the features and transparency that you speak about may well create uh, a different use case. But uh, you know, this, this is not the, I guess the platform, we don't have the time to debate that, but maybe for another time, but thank you for that, appreciate it. Absolutely. absolutely. Rajiv, you wanted to ask a question? Uh, Hi, Hank. Thanks for your time and uh, insights. One of the most fundamental uh, question which has been always hitting me and why I have uh, refrained myself going forward has been the issue of when we say blockchain and there is so much of uh, bits of every transaction which is in, uh, incorporated whenever there is a transfer and still the moment it gets had and that particular token also is getting used. Now, how is that permitted when we say that the ledgers are being maintained at all the ends? So if somebody has lost his tokens by simple things like uh, hacking or uh, wrongly transfer, there should be a system of reclaiming it back. And so somebody- Roger, that, that, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a long. I apologize, uh, Vance. I I had mentioned earlier. I actually have a board meeting starting a few minutes ago, um, so I have to going to hop in a second. But you know, I think that the question that you're raising is a, is a very fundamental one, which is the power of uh, distributed ledger and the 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 nemesis of it. The very thing that makes it powerful is the fact that no individual can quote reclaim it, and that's why you can be confident that if you have it. A uh, central authority, a government, uh, an individual, a bank, et cetera, can't take it away from you. It's a fundamental asset that belongs to you in the blockchain. Whereas if, 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 if a central authority could uh, reclaim it, then you are back to the central control authority model where, uh, where um, you know, the value of that ecosystem is as good as your trust and reliability into the central authority, which may be great, but that's not what led to the creation of it. But I, I sincerely apologize. I would love to continue this, but I actually have to hop on uh, onto sure. board meeting. So. Thank, thank you so much, Hank. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks a lot, yeah. Hank. Thank you for your time. It was a wonderful session. And I, I hope all our members have benefited from this. We will keep this going. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks all. Thank you, everyone. I think Sandhya wanted to, you know, do an open discussion, but but I think she's left because of time. No, 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 I'm there. Oh, you are um, here, Sandhya? Yeah, 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 yeah. Please go ahead. No, I'm not sure how many people have the time because we are running, uh, you know, it's all one up. But it is interesting for me because uh, one of the um, startups that I'm involved with is actually in the creator economy. 
Uh, and she has got, I think, a significant number. She started off by collating uh, the data of about 40, 50,000 musicians, musicians, artisans. She's a filmmaker. So she created that and she's got a virtual uh, uh, film festival. This year, she's trying to put it onto blockchain. Uh, and it's exactly, you know, I think when uh, Hank was describing it, it's the, um, you know, it's the tool set for to tokenization. How can everyone in the system get money? And so I think that's what she's right now working on. If it is relevant to this community at some point, we can even ask because she is obviously going to come for fundraising at some point. And if you're interested, we can always discuss with her. So why don't you why don't you present her, uh, you know, for fundraising here in our group? Let's see, you know, how we evaluate it and take it forward. That's a yeah, great start. I'd be, I'd be very interested in doing that because I think uh, right now she's actually taken this particular use case to uh, the Gulf News as part of their 3.0 decoded or something like that because they saw that uh, you know the creator economy and the potential value in that uh, music uh, 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 ecosystem. The second one is actually another um, startup that I'm involved with. Uh, the founder is based out of um, Israel, but it's in the supply chain uh, and contractor contractors around the globe. Uh, it doesn't need to remain within the uh, supply chain. It can be for any other contractors providing services where local requirements are needed, but I think the first use case was in the supply chain. Again, uh, uh, the development is happening in the blockchain. The whole idea being that you can add um, uh, the data uh, and then try and see whether you can uh, have tokens across the various jurisdictions in which they operate. You know, I think that it requires a little more longer discussion and if you want, we can ask him to present it to this forum just for interest if uh, anyone is, uh, anyone would find it interesting purely from a technology point of view as well. So it's great, Sandhya. What we will do is we will, you know, this series is continuing for another two to three weeks. And at the end of that, we can do a, a session for at least three, four blockchain companies who, are, who can all present to us. And then whichever we find good, we take them into the main, uh, you know, group of YN for funding. That'll be great. Um, I'll, I'll reach out to you separately to kind of oh. uh, see if you go ahead with it. Okay. So thank you very much. I think we have run out of time, though we can continue. But, uh, you know, we, let's, let's do it next. Next Monday is very interesting. We have uh, another very important speaker. You know, he's done quite a lot of work in blockchain. So he'll bring in a very different perspective. So hope to see you soon next week. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Ari. Thank you, Ari, for organizing this. Thanks. Yeah, this is fantastic. Thank you so much. Very nice. Very good sessions. Thank you.